and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where it seems in the battle of In the Heights versus West Side Stories, there are no winners, as both are total box office bombs. West Side Story actually came in under In the Heights, and that's right, if I had to call it, I'd ha- right now, uh, the fight's not over, which we'll talk about in a moment, but right now it seems that In the Heights has the slight edge, because at least that debuted day, on, day and date on HBO Max, and again, still managed to beat out Steven Spielberg by about a million, but still, it's ahead. These are very low numbers. This is ridiculous. Uh, otherwise, the two films are pretty much tied when it comes to critics' praise, audience ratings, those who saw it, and really bad box office. But as I said, the fight ain't over yet, as we'll see who walks away with the most awards noms and maybe wins. At least both films don't have to worry about anyone feeling that they they succeeded at the box office and already have their gold, Uh, right? Golden Globes and Critics' Choice noms come out tomorrow morning, and Oscar noms don't come out until February 8th. Move that ceremony up. It's ridiculous. The Oscars are too much becoming an afterthought. So what's the problem here with these two movies? Because this is shocking, particularly for Steven Spielberg and such incredible work from him, uh, no less. Well, Hollywood is pointing the finger at the fractured Latino audience, uh, which is divided by country and region. And unlike other groups, doesn't show up as reliably as a whole to the box office, which could hurt Latino representation in movies going forward if a Hollywood uh, and the Latino community can't find a way to come together. Remember, Hollywood doesn't do anything unless they can make a buck doing so. For instance, there were no complaints that Black Panther didn't feature actors from Africa. Yet on social media, despite um, Steven Spielberg casting Latino and Afro-Latino actors, a a criticism uh, leveled at In the Heights, Many still had a problem with West Side Story because it didn't cast specifically Puerto Rican actors. And no matter how you might feel about that criticism, here's the bottom line. The audience for West Side Story this weekend was 52% Caucasian. And for a movie like that, that's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. Caucasians in New York City, to be specific, because AMC Lincoln Square and the Regal 42nd Street were by far and away the top performing locations. It's interesting, West Side Story of of course takes place in New York City, so that might have helped the film appeal to that audience as well. Now, Deadline revealed a very unusual statistic that isn't usually discussed, so it's a goodie for us to, to go over. And that's that this weekend in all of North America, about 800,000 tickets were sold. That's nuts considering the size of the the potential movie-going population in North America. That's how few people can go to the movies. That's what gives you about a $10 million uh, number opening weekend. Wow. Deadline also noted that 88% of those moviegoers went before 8 p.m., which hints at an older demographic. But again, not even that many in that group because the number, the opening weekend is so small. Yes, older moviegoers still aren't comfortable going to the theater, although Bond did get older men to the multiplex. Hollywood is also blaming the holiday season, saying West Side Story just wanted to get out ahead of of Spider-Man No Way Home, and it will have legs like The Greatest Showman, with older moviegoers and older women in particular who were apparently West Side Story's target audience. That makes no sense. That means the film was incorrectly made and marketed. But, you know, when older women aren't so busy prepping for the holidays. I don't see a Greatest Showman situation here, and I'll tell you why. That was a great movie. But here, I'll tell you why. First... I do agree with Hollywood. Some other op- There's a couple other Hollywood observations that I think are, are very savvy. And that's that West Side Story, for all its Oscars, is not a hugely popular musical, especially with modern audiences. Second, I also agree that West Side Story lacked star power and was in fact also hurt with younger moviegoers by Ansel Elgort, uh, who might not have done anything illegal, but has definitely been creeping on the internet. I mean, if you saw his Instagram account before he pruned it, He had some real questionable pictures on that. But here's what Hollywood won't admit, and that's that it seems that people on both sides of the political spectrum aren't interested in political uh, entertainment these days. They are instead looking to Hollywood and the entertainment world for an escape. This is the real problem for Hollywood going forward. Just wait till you hear this. 
So conservatives don't want to be yelled at or told they're stupid. Liberals don't want to be frustrated and told they're inept. And moderates don't want to be reminded what a mess they're stuck in the middle of. And you can see similar problems with discussions and entertainment about race and economics. Things are so tense right now, it seems audience would prefer Hollywood just stay out of it, especially if it's the same old, same old when it comes to Hollywood's thoughts on the situations. I think it's clear that Hollywood and... Um, Again, all sides of all different parts of moviegoers don't agree. And so <clears throat> they just don't want to hear it from Hollywood anymore. With, with the rare exception of biting commentary like Joker and Squid Game, uh, both of those appeal to the 99% and not only depict them with truth, but also dignity and compassion from that perspective, you know, from the inside looking out instead of the outside looking in. That's crucial. And I'm, I'm hoping that Nightmare Alley might fall in that same category because I'm really rooting for that movie. Good thing Don't Look Up, though, isn't really hitting theaters because I think that movie is going to really illustrate this problem as well. Uh, that's just a simple awards play from Netflix. Uh, but I think that you know, Don't Look Up, West Side Story, this is the type of film that has always worked really well for Hollywood. This is the type of film that Hollywood has always wanted to celebrate uh, with their awards uh, system, right? I mean, Hollywood's always been about strong social commentary. Now, that's driven awards show ratings down for a while, uh, for the past uh, decade or so. It's, that hasn't been going well. But at least award contenders could still see a box office spike. You know, it's only ABC's problem that people aren't, I guess also the Academy, that people aren't watching the Oscars, but it's all of Hollywood's problem if they don't go and see these movies or stream them or rent them. So that's a problem. So if Hollywood, if, if moviegoers to lose total interest in anything that Hollywood has to say, well, I, I mean, I don't think Hollywood should, Hollywood should stop with their commentary, but maybe it's a, 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 it's a message I need to get different voices in there and, again, stop saying the same stuff. Oh, and also start saying some new stuff. Because, you know, again, films like Joker and, Su and shows like Suicide, uh, um, uh, um, Squid Game are still resonating. So there is an interest in so, uh, some commentary still. It's really interesting because, you know, Hollywood has been coasting on the same kind of commentary since, like, they, they started. So that's really crazy. Just like there has to be a shift in who's voting for awards, uh, you know, there's been a discussion about that. It might even be, be beyond that. Oh, fascinating. I love this. All right. So anyway. Now, some also have argued, and I was also tempted to argue this as well, as well, that maybe streaming has truly killed the drama at the box office. But I looked it up, and that's not true, as the most successful dramas throughout Hollywood history have still had a wow factor or some unique angle. So, you know, I think that, I think Wes, I think Steven Spielberg felt that he was the wow factor, and I think, you know, I saw the movie, I think he was, uh, but... Again, I think people maybe weren't interested in what Steven Spielberg and Tony Kushner have to say about um, the fight the, that the fight between those two demographics, it's, and that's that's I think very interesting. All right, so then of course, speaking of big screen uh, uh, spectacles, and and it's also turning out to be an obstacle. There's also the giant spider in the room sucking up everyone's attention and most likely their movie ticket money. Spider Man No Way Home. Huge blockbusters like this are usually relegated to the summer corridor when they, where they can be given large berths, right? Uh, here, I think for the releasing in December, the two best comparisons, which have transformed the December release uh, date uh, schedule, are Avatar, which did it first, and then The Force Awakens, which was when Disney decided to camp out there. Uh, you know, after Spider-Man No Way Home, we're going back to Star Wars and Avatar, alternating back and forth every Christmas. So this is good. I mean, I hope that awards... I hope that studios are paying attention on how to schedule their awards films around these big blockbusters because this is a problem that's not going to go away. So The Force Awakens, 2015. That year, awards flicks did well by coming out on Christmas Day after The Force Awakens to play throughout January. You had The Revenant and The Hateful Eight opening uh, Christmas Day. Sometimes, you know, 1917 did the same thing. Sometimes limited. Uh, and then they go for, they expand throughout January and February all the way up through the Oscars. And then, oh, they, they explode with, with the Oscars and then they win a bunch of them. That seems to be the better strategy. Then back in 2009 with Avatar, itself a huge awards contender. You know, right now these films are not awards contenders. Av we'll see how Avatar 2 does. But Avatar switched it up even more so in that it was not only a blockbuster film, but an awards contender itself. You know, James Cameron, Titanic, one of the most, the most successful drama of all time. He has the top two. 
Is Avatar a drama? I don't know. I don't think so. No, it's a sci-fi film. But anyway, Titanic's definitely a drama. But that had spectacle. All right, so anyway, Up in the Air managed to compete with Avatar that year because it came out in limited release in early December and had a slow rollout, only going wide after Avatar was released. Plus, it also had George Clooney's star power, which was considerable at the time. So I think it's clear that it was a mistake for any awards film to open prior to Spider-Man No Way Home, which is taking up all the air and money uh, in the room and not allowing any conversation to generate for these other movies. Uh, The Matrix, I think, coming out right after doesn't help either because it blocks out the Christmas release strategy as well because you now you have two blockbusters back to back. That's been the case in the past with like, you know, Jumanji coming out usually too at the same time, Aquaman. But the Matrix, I think, you know, usually they don't come out for Christmas Day. They would have come out a little earlier in the month. But so it's crazy. We'll see how Matrix and Spider-Man No Way Home do sharing December. Anyway, I think being the Ricardos and Don't Look Up uh, is, are also further complicated by the fact that they're from streaming services who opened their movies early in December so they could debut them on their services for Christmas Day, uh, which might help them with the conversation. But still, I think it, it hurts both of them not to be hot out of the gate. Uh, I think they should have debuted them on their services for New Year's and opened them in theaters on Christmas Day. But, you know, both services, Amazon usually does a better job distributing in theaters. But Netflix, of course, is infamous for how how few theaters and for how short a window they they put their theatrical releases. Uh, That's why the Academy is still so upset with them. Anyway, Nightmare Alley should have opened Christmas Day instead of the same day as Spider-Man No Way Home. But it does have some preview screenings this Wednesday to try and get some momentum going before No Way Home hits. And those 7 p.m. showings, I checked it out, seem to be doing brisk business. So there's still hope for that film. And as I said, I hope maybe it ties into the same uh, commentary as Joker and Squid Game as it's not political, but instead focuses on the cruelty of the world and the haves and have nots. This is a very good movie. I really like it. I think it actually is kind of like that. I hope it is. Let's cram it in that box because I want it to do well. As for Spider-Man No Way Home, the trades are trying to keep expectations sane, with it open, saying that it will open around 150, which you'll recall I said last week is where I think the film will most likely open as well. Uh, I'd say anywhere from 150 to just under 200, but it could still have a two in front of it. We'll see. As for the rest of the top 10, Encanto, which uh, also offers Latino representation but benefits from being a Disney animated movie, that's holding nicely. It had a very nice hold, and it might make it to the century mark before it hits Disney Plus Christmas Eve at no extra cost. Well, Ghostbusters Afterlife, another family flick with some flashy VFX, uh, part of a franchise, is quickly catching up to Jungle Cruise and Free Guy domestically. That's interesting. It surpassed Dune. Dune, of course, HBO Max day and date release. And Dune suffered one of the biggest drops, um, actually the biggest drop for a mainstream film this weekend because it lost its re-release IMAX screens to West Side Story. All right, as for streaming, guess what? Nielsen didn't update their ratings this week. I don't know what's going on over there. They're like the only place that we have to get some like uh, fair ratings for streaming. And like, let's hope they can hold it together because they're under attack for doing so. (laughs) As for Netflix on their own site, for the week after Thanksgiving, The Power of the Dog debuted at number one worldwide. A nice little headline for their awards frontrunner. And Christmas movies are doing fantastic as Netflix continues to come for Hallmark's Christmas crown. That's serious, because that's really big for Hallmark, the Hallmark Channel. As for, and I, you, I hope that you'll see other streaming services start to follow suit as well, because people want to watch new Christmas movies, because we've seen the other ones so many times. Uh, at, I'm doing that myself this year. Uh, I've watched Christmas again on the Disney Channel. It was not my idea, as you can imagine, but I actually thought it was uh, really fun. Uh, all right, and I, and I also watched Die Hard 2 last night to mix the things up a little bit. All right, as for series, it's bittersweet for me to see Lost in Space Season 3 debut at number one globally, a fantastic family sci-fi series that brought its A-game every darn time. I watched Season 3 in 24 hours straight. It was so good. It's a shame that this is its final mission. Season 1 even popped in the top 10 too, though, which gives me hope that Netflix will maybe bring it back in a few years. They should. It's so good. I would really like for that to come back. Don't sleep on Lost in Space. Go watch it now so we can get more of it. You know what's not coming back, though? Cowboy Bebop, down there at the bottom in its third week, showing a significant drop after it surged in week two to second place. And, you know, sure enough, once again, the show creators were like, we had so much great stuff planned. Never plan your great stuff for season two. Do your best stuff out of the gate so that you can have a, a, a sequel or a season two. Over on iTunes, No Time to Die is back at number one. Uh, Barbara Broccoli and Amy Pascal, Hollywood super producers. We love to see it. I love to see women representing so successfully. 
And both of them, by the way, really stuck to their guns on certain things and succeeded. They won. And I'm thrilled to see my favorite Grinch with Benny C, that uh, everyone else is favorite as well as it's number two. Watch that every year. I finally purchased it this year. I'm like, why am I running it this year? It's, it's extras were only medium though. Darn it, I have better extras. As for what's coming out this week, Spider-Man No Way Home is finally here. Do you have your tickets yet? And if so, when are you seeing it? And how many times have you already bought tickets for? I know a number of you are holding batches. Batches! Oh, that's exciting. It's exciting times. Uh, Nightmare Alley will also open exclusively in theaters on the tiniest screens that are left. But you know what? Come on, go see it. If you get sold out of Spider-Man No Way Home, I'm begging you, consider watching Nightmare Alley. It's really, really good. I hope that, again, it do, it's, I hope it does a Revenant play in the 1917 play where it's really big throughout January. It deserves it, damn it. All right, so anyway, guess what else comes out on Friday? The Witcher Season 2! What? That's going to be on Netflix on Friday. Uh, it has turned out to be a spectacularly bad idea to debut it on uh, December 17th. They opened it really big the first time, uh, opposite, I think, like one of the Star Wars movies, right? And that worked out okay, but Spider-Man No Way Home is like Avengers Endgame level hype, and The Witcher is just not able to compete. It's nuts. They paid Henry Cavill so much money per episode. Is that Was that all the money they had left for... Did they take it out of the publicity budget? They're not advertising it to mainstream audiences at all and have instead chosen to focus almost exclusively, it seems, on the Witcher fan community, which is substantial and also mostly overseas. But, you know, global uh, Netflix is a global business, as we can see from their rankings. So, well, maybe, let's, maybe they're crazy like a fox. We'll see what happens with it. Uh, Netflix also will release awards contender film The Hand of God from the creator of The Young Pope, as well as more holiday movies. Elsewhere on streaming this week, Peacock brings back MacGruber. P people really like MacGruber. He has his own series. The trailer looked pretty good. Again, I think this is an awful time to bring it out. But, you know, I think there is a fandom there, and, you know, that could be, a, a, I think, at least somewhat of a win for Peacock. HBO Ma Max has the ambitious sci-fi uh, uh, show Station Eleven, which I'm still not quite sure is about, uh, and reality competition Finding Magic Mike. That's crazy. HBO Max has a slight sleaze factor to it, but it seems to be working really well for them. You know, like, what's that, like, F Island, right? Oh, F, F Boy Island, and that's not what they're calling it. I'm, I'm censoring it. <laughs> All right, it got renewed, I think. All right, so anyway, and Amazon has a new show with love, uh, where each episode spotlights the Diaz family during a different holiday, including Christmas and New Year's. So that's this week's movie math. What do you, why do you think West Side Story opened so poorly? Or I guess more accurately, why didn't you see it? Because it seems most of you didn't. Are you waiting to see it? Says so, uh, Disney Fox and Steven Spielberg, fingers crossed. And what would your strategy be for any of these awards films to coexist with Spider-Man No Way Home? And how do you think The Matrix is going to do uh, competing with it? Uh, also, uh, in one week, we will be discussing Spider-Man No Way Home's opening weekend. And that is exciting stuff. All right, share those thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.